Hello, hello. Welcome to the Pub Show. Today, hello. My guests yes, are Jonathan and Derek. Um, Jonathan and Derek are leaders of innovators in diversity. Their organization, Leadership Brainery, is a reflection of their values and the communities they serve. They are visionaries, innovators, leaders, and learners working with passion and intention with a common urge to change the world for a better place. So I figured who better to have on to speak about leadership and, and innovation than these guys. So welcome, Derek and Jonathan. Oh, awesome. Pete, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, really excited about the conversation today. Yes, so I, uh, I want to start off with if you could tell the listeners a little about what you do and what inspired you to make this your mission. Awesome. All right, let's do it. Maybe I can start off. Kick us out. All right, everyone. So I'm Derek, and I'm the co-founder, along with Jonathan, of Leadership Brainery. I am also serve as the executive director. So um, our story with Leadership Brainery goes back all the way to 2013 when we were college students at Grandma State University at HBCU, historically Black College and University in Louisiana. And we were very active student leaders. Jonathan was student body president and I served on his executive board of director of student relations. And um, we were doing things on our campus, but also throughout the country. And many other young leaders started asking us, how are we getting so much done? And so we started training other student groups, mostly student government associations on um, how to build their network, how to leverage their administration, um, how to listen to their student body so they can address the proper concerns. Um, and so we did that throughout college and graduate school. And when we did get to graduate school, what we saw immediately was the lack of diversity and underrepresentation of um, many groups who are systemically oppressed, especially in the United States and around the, um, around the world. And so when we went to admissions asking, what's the issue? Why are we one of the very few um, black students in the institution? Um, they shared that we can't find qualified diverse candidates. And we knew um, that we've been training this amazing talent for years. And all of these leaders um, has aspirations to um, be professionals, whether that's in the legal space, the medical space, the business space, um, or the education space. And so, um, we evolved our model a bit to serve as a pipeline for underrepresented talent to access um, competitive postgraduate degrees. And so um, we are doing this work for a time. It's our passion um, and that's our story. Jonathan, if I miss anything, uh, then jump right in there. No, I don't think you missed anything at all. Um, so that is the work that we're doing. Leadership Brainery's theory of change is that with greater access to advanced education and inclusive networks and support systems that underrepresented communities can leverage higher impact and higher wage opportunities, career opportunities to stabilize their families um, and also reinvest in their communities as a way to help close wealth and opportunity gaps. Um, so we are very fortunate uh, to be doing this work. Um, there is no time more important to be doing it and uh, thus change can't wait. And that is the, the movement that we're building around access to graduate level education um, so that we can level up and we can begin to kind of redistributing not only resources but power. Um, in, in our country, in our world. Um, so we're really excited to be um, having this conversation um, because leadership branding was, as Derek mentioned, birthed out of our lived experience. And so we bring that with us um, to what we do every single day, um, kind of reflecting on um, what we experience um, and how can we make things better for those coming after us. I love that you guys think so big. Um, and I think it's so important for our leaders to be compassionate. You know, um, I think Simon Sinek says, be the leader you wish to be. And I genuinely see that in you guys, you guys embody what you're teaching. Um, and you know, that also makes me realize that we don't manage people. We manage files. We lead people. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, a boss is a title, but leaders have the people um that's and, so real yeah because it's not about being in charge it's about taking care of those in your charge so i'm curious yeah. how do you two define leadership i feel in in many ways leadership is a responsibility 
form of responsibility and, and, and obligation um, and accountability um, even. I think a lot of people do kind of embrace the glitz and glam of being in the forefront, but leaders aren't always in the forefront. You have leaders that are um, behind the scenes and not necessarily in the spotlight, but irrespective of kind of your position um, the reality is that an effective leader um, is someone that feels committed um, to um, uplifting others, bringing others along, and, and, and that requires that they carry a sense of obligation and responsibility to do that at their best ability, do it with empathy, do it with grace, do it with passion, do it with conviction and purpose, a sense of purpose, um, and, and a sense of commitment to what is in the best interest of the collective whole. I talk often about collective responsibility and, and see leadership in that way, which also requires that leaders think about how to take care of themselves, um, because how can we lead others and we're not positioning ourselves to be our most authentic, whole and healthy self. And, and that's why I encourage people all the time that leaders who are concerned with social transformation must take care of themselves by developing self-awareness social awareness and spiritual awareness that that's the three part um, framework that I've been kind of cultivating over the last few years and, and really advocating for people to develop self awareness, social awareness and spiritual awareness. So those are some of my initial thoughts. D, what you think? Uh, I think you hit on it. I would say to um, just in my own words that leaders, leaders are individuals who really appreciate community and understand the value of community. Um, all the work that we do, all the change that um, leaders have made throughout our history that leaders are making now only happen with community, o only happens when we bring other folks to the table. Um, and sometimes people single out leaders as if they're individuals, but you can't be a leader without a community. Mm -hmm. um, you can't be a leader without different perspectives and, and valuing those different perspectives and, and skills that people come with. Um, anybody who think they can do it all themselves um, are not leaders. And so mm -hmm. we have to bring in other folks to make sure that we're um, cultivating and appreciating all the different perspectives and skill sets people come with. And see, and that's why we need more and more leaders at the intersections, like in the intersections who are thinking about the different flows of community, the different journeys that people are on and finding ways to connect us across those differences, across those varying backgrounds um, and experiences. Um, more and more that's super important if we're going to foster societies and communities of hope, belonging and action. That's so true that we do need leaders like that, but how do we train people to be leaders? I think this is honestly mm. a problem on a systemic level. Uh, and I think we st we're starting to see a shift in narrative we're, we're starting to speak about these things because really I'm I see my own academic career and I feel like on a subconscious level on at the high tiers there seems to be a lot of ego involved mm -hmm. and on a subconscious le level that's what we're teaching students mm -hmm. that like it's okay to behave like that and mm -hmm. those are our leaders you know mm -hmm. um and so I really think it's important for us to um, perhaps have unified guiding values as a as humanity maybe you know because I, I think some would argue that religion used to provide that for us and as we stray away from religion we're not straying towards guiding values we're straying away from those as well and um, you know instead we're valuing things like finance and not valuing things like education, where I'm making upwards of a quarter of a million dollars spreading or pasting and copying from spreadsheet to spreadsheet versus when I was working at the preschool, raising little balls of consciousnesses, I was getting paid minimum wage. It's like, yeah, so how do we implement that into our society on a deeper level? Because I think the answer isn't just higher education, but also going down to the root of where education begins. Absolutely. Exactly, exactly. You know, I, I think that many times we confuse um, positions with leadership. 
And just because you have certain positions and certain titles, or you may be a professor or a dean, um, doesn't necessarily make you a leader. Um, you are in a position that has influence, have power, um, but we really need to def redefine what leaders actually are. Um, so even if you are down the, um, the, the workflow in your job, it's really the values that you bring. How are you bringing people together? How are you listening to folks' concerns um, that makes you a leader, not necessarily where you lie um, on that diagram? Um, and I think we have a, a lot of re-educating to do, um, uneducating to do around that, that topic for sure. Yeah, and I think to that point, um, it, it really is um, this notion of helping people, one, um, overcome this sense of individualism um, that, that we've embraced, um, I think, to our detriment um, mm -hmm. in our society. And the reality is we are interconnected, interrelated, and interdependent. We need each other. And there are leaders that are out there. On, on all sorts of spectrum, doing all kinds of things, whether it's someone who is taking primary responsibility for supporting their family to someone who is within their, their school community and they're involved with helping raise issues that are affecting um, them and their peers um, to um, someone who is running for office because they saw an issue and, and they wanted to represent and advocate on behalf of, of their, their community, to entrepreneurs and innovators who are creating ventures to respond um, to issues or problems and experiences that they've had in their lives or people that they care about. So the spectrum of who's a leader um, is, is very wide. And I say that to say that the leaders are out there. So to your question, Pavashay, how do we uplift them? How do we support them? How do we cultivate them? I think what we need most, as you mentioned, is the opportunity to unify, the opportunity for us to learn from each other, the opportunity for us to build community together, whereby we have support system, we have a network um, of other leaders um, that we can lean on, um, that we can deposit and invest into, and who can reciprocate that into us as well. And I think oftentimes if you talk to many leaders, they, they say they feel as if they're doing this all alone. Mm -hmm. They feel as if they don't necessarily have um, people replenishing them after they've dished and given so much out. Um, and I think more than anything, we, that's what leaders need um, is community of other leaders that they can be in, 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 in community with, um, that they can be in solidarity with. Um, and, and to that point, um, we have to continue um, to help people um, see um, that, that life itself is beyond just us individually um, and that we are part of a collective whole. Um, and so I think that's, that's really what's holding us back um, quite often is as Derek mentioned, this very um, um, traditional way of looking at leadership as position-based um, instead of literally um, being something that is innate, um, something that's inside of us. I know the question is always raised about are leaders born or are leaders cultivated um, over time? And I think in many ways, there's probably a mixture of both happening um, for people um, who, who are leaders indeed. Yeah, that's such an Interesting concept. Are they born or are they cultivated? It's almost the same question as nature versus nurture. Mm -hmm. But I do want to shift gears a little because one thing that comes up with leadership is innovation. And, you know, innovation, I think people think it's like inventing something, but that's not necessarily the case. Innovation and invention are two different mm -hmm. things. For example, Gutenberg created the printing press in 1450, so he could share culture and education. Um, and the, Steve Jobs did the same thing with the personal computer centuries later. Yes, they invented, but they could have invented and sat on their invention. It's how yeah. they implement it into society that innov became innovative. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the combination of, an. for me, I think I would define a visionary as in someone who can be innovative and be a leader simultaneously simultaneously mm -hmm. so could you guys clarify what what do you guys think is innovation how would you describe that 
Well, Jonathan, you're the innovator of residence at Boston <laughs> University, so I'll let you jump in there. Shout out to the Build Lab. Um, so I think that innovators are problem solvers, and I think that you you can be an inventor and be an innovator at the same time, but being an innovator doesn't automatically make you an inventor, mm -hmm. right? So, so I, I think that's the the flow um, for, for me, um, and that innovation uh, quite often um, encapsulates um, the the journey of someone who's trying to solve a problem. Whether that leads to you creating an actual invention is is another iteration of, of innovation um, to me. Um, just like you can be an innovator and not necessarily be an entrepreneur. Um, I, I think those distinctions are, are really key, but I think the common thread for all of them is innovation. And innovation is happening every single day as we are trying to survive. Every day we're trying to figure out, okay, what did I learn yesterday about making it to the next day? And how can I contribute? How can I, I can allow that to influence how I continue to journey in my life? And so I think just by nature of survival instinct, um, we are in many ways um, all inventors, um, or not inventors, but innovators, um, because we are all trying um, to solve a problem every single um, day, wh whether that's how to survive, make money, pay your bills. Um, to how to build a venture, um, whatever that spectrum is, um, to me, innovation is at the core of problem solving. Yeah, and I would even say innovation is also creating creativity. Um, yeah. I, I shared this story. I was talking to a young lady um, a few weeks ago, and um, I actually met her at the Innovation Center. She was working as the secretary there. And so I had told her I had my master's in public health. She was interested in public health. And when we started talking, um, I asked her, do she consider herself as an innovator? She's working at the Innovate Lab. Um, and she said no. And so we were on Zoom at the time. And I saw her background in her um, dorm room. And it was decorated really nicely. Seemed like just a very um, welcoming environment, but then also a comfortable environment. And so I asked her, I was like, did you create, did you design your room? And she was like, yeah. And I said, well, then you're an innovator. Like you were able to create a space that was conducive and comfortable for you um, out of nothing. I mean, I've seen a lot of people rooms um, and many times folks just have blank rooms, no art, no anything and creativity there. Um, but she had that. And I said, so you are an innovator because you were able to create that um, and fill this gap that you probably even didn't realize that you need it in your life, um, you can do that in other areas. And I think many times um, folks don't consider themselves innovators, that they have the creativity um, to build, to come up with things, to, um, to mobilize, whether that is things or people, um, to make something happen. But if we just look around and say, oh, when I was younger, I actually started a lemonade stand. Um, but I haven't done anything like that since. And it was just like, well, you were being innovative in that moment and it's really innate to you. And we just have to tap into um, what makes us spark, what makes us excited um, and seeing how can we come up and, and gather all of our skill sets and, and education that we have gained over our life um, to, to, to pull something together. And that's innovation to me um, is definitely creativity. Right. Hey, and I, and I, th I think what's powerful about that is this quote that I often share with people from my, one of my mentors um, who passed away years ago, um, Pastor William O'Neill. He would always say that if you do what you've always done, you will get what you've always got. And I think innovators embody that notion um, every single day, trying to do something different um, instead of following the same mold of the same patterns because they recognize that if we do what we've always done, we will get the same results. We will get what we've always got. So how do we come up with more creative solutions? That It's so true. I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure if uh, you guys have heard of the metaverse. I'm sure you have. Yep. Uh, and people are scared and a lot I'm of there. things are coming to question, but I think this could be an opportunity for us as humanity to innovate education. Mm. It, that we're creating a whole new universe. Why can't we create a whole new educational system as well? Mm. But that's mm. a half-baked thought, maybe. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think it's a good thought. I, I do think that 
um, especially not only in America, I, I always point out America, that's this where we are, United States, but all around the world, we have these equity issues. Um, we have the have and the have nots. And so when we um, already, if we look at the data, we have these huge technology gaps. You know, we saw it even more when COVID happened and we had to move to virtual um, education. Um, for a lot of marginalized communities, they didn't have access to the technology to keep up. Um, at the same level as more affluent communities. And so when we start thinking about things like the, the metaverse, the, the thing that scares me most um, is the communities who are gonna be left out of that for so long. Um, and if we see even um, five years and you have these affluent communities who can access this amazing technology where they can be different spaces um, at one time, and then you have these communities um, who are left behind, that's a huge technology shift. And like you're saying, I, I do think there's a lot of opportunity that comes there, but how do we really ensure before we put it out that we have an equity plan? Otherwise, it's just gonna make our disparities a lot worse than they currently are. And that's exactly why leadership writery is leadership writery. And we focus on cultivating leaders um, because a pathway to driving equity is making sure um, that more and more leaders from underrepresented and diverse backgrounds are at the table, helping to think about those implications, those equity considerations, and ensuring that we're calibrating um, our approaches um, to support communities that are historically left out um, and, and, and partnering with different institutional stakeholders, including the government um, and nonprofit organizations and corporations abroad, community leaders too, on how we connect those dots and really ensure um, that our most marginalized communities are at the forefront and are receiving um, the resources and support that they need to be a part of this progression, this expansion, this evolution. And I'm not trying to even say that um, everyone who comes from marginalized communities um, that we have to take this deficit lens. We have a lot of folks who have um, pushed, a, pushed a lot of systemic barriers um, and gained great access, great privilege to education. Um, so even leadership, Brandon, as Jonathan just said, really bringing leaders to the table, um, we do try to target a lot of different leaders who have gain access um, and has some sort of privilege, whether that is um, just having merit-based um, education access where they were um, just high performers and they got into the institutions, but they may come from low um, social economic backgrounds, um, but just making sure that we are also not taking a deficit approach and saying everybody that comes from non-white communities are poor and broke and uneducated, that's not the case. And um, we do have amazing, amazing talent out there. And so how do we make sure that they are um, at the top of metaverse, making sure that this plan is equitable um, and not feeling a lot of these large companies feel like, well, um, we have to just solely give to charity for us to have our um, make our equity and diversity quota. And it's not the case. You need to hire and make sure that you're listening um, to the experts that necessarily don't look like you, but have some of the same knowledge. Exactly. Yes. Well, I mean, I think you guys are doing a great job and we could go on about this for hours because that's not all what Leadership Brainery does. Uh, for listeners who want to know more about what Leadership Brainery does and what you guys do, where can they find you? So you can find us on the web at Leadership Brainery, that's B-R-A-I-N-E-R-Y dot org or on social media at Leadership Brainery. Uh, and we're basically everywhere. So LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, you can find us just or Google us. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on. This was a great conversation. Yes, yeah, it's so incredible. And we really appreciate your leadership, PB. Well, thank you guys. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And I, if I can make a quick plug. So we <laughs> are doing our Change Can't Wait campaign right now. And we are looking for individuals who care about um, diversity, equity, and access to become peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers for Leadership Brainery um, so they can tap into their network and raise, whether that's $100 or $5,000, um, or if you just donate to the cause. Um, this is our Change Can't Wait campaign. And we know even from this conversation that change can't wait. We have to make something happen. So 
Um, so find us on social media so you can tap in. There. It's our it's our biggest um, push um, around a campaign that we've had to date. So we're really excited about it. The campaign ends on December 31st and we are going to raise $100,000 by the end of this year um, for this campaign in particular. So yes, as Derek said, please chip in wherever you can, however you feel convicted and compelled, help spread the word and become a fundraiser yourself. It's a peer-to-peer -peer campaign. So we have a general campaign, but then individual fundraisers can kind of launch their own campaign that then feeds into the, the general goal. Um, so if that's you, if, if you're committed and, and want to get involved, we'd love to have you. And the first 10 individuals to reach their campaign, their fundraising goal will receive a free um, Leadership Rainery Change Camp Wait hoodie um, that's that's coming in today, actually. And so we're really excited about it. Yes, Thank you all. Guys, change really can't wait, but maybe a conversation for another day. Yes. <laughs>